again, good evening, and thank you for being here at Rome Historical Society's third Wednesday program, Underground Railroad in Rome. Um, I am Miranda, and I'm the educator at Rome Historical Society, and we have Judith Wellman here with us. Uh, so we are live on Facebook, and we are live on Zoom, and I want to let everyone know this program is going to be available online um, immediately after the program ends tonight. So you can revisit it, rewatch it, share it with someone who isn't available right now to watch it. Um, and so I will give you more information on that at the end of the program as we wrap up. I wanna give a shout out really quick to the corporate members of Rome Historical Society. Uh, we are a member-based organization. So we really rely on the support and generosity of our members. Um, so Mohawk Valley Community College, AIS, Revere Copper, and Antonovich Group. Just wanted to give that shout out to them. Uh, if you can, I'm sure we're, uh, you're all aware, uh, try to keep your mics muted and be aware too that if your video is on, we can see you. Um, and, uh, we would like to open up at the end of the program for questions. So if you have a question, you can save it till the end. I'm also gonna be monitoring the chat and the Facebook comments as well. So um, you can put your questions, comments, concerns in those two places. And at the end, I'll try to address as many of them as we can. And we can have Judy here um, answer all of your questions that you may have. Um, <laughs> So I'm gonna formally introduce our presenter now. Uh, so Judy Wellman, she um, was a professor at SUNY Oswego, and now she is the principal investigator at Historic New York Research Associates. Um, and her research focuses on historic sites all across New York state as they relate to women's rights, um, the Underground Railroad and African-American life. And tonight, we're going to be hearing about the Underground Railroad in central New York, and specifically Rome. Um, so as you may know, the Underground Railroad was a network of people and places used by escaped slaves um, seeking freedom. And here in Rome, there was uh, easy access to transportation, so roads, railways, and the canal. Um, so it was sort of a hot spot for these freedom seekers. And um, a lot of them ended up staying and, and settling down in this area as well. So we're gonna hear some of the stories of the places and the people that were um, involved in that era as they relate to Judy's research. So uh, Judy, thank you so much for being here. I'm gonna hand it over to you and uh, take it away. Thank you, Miranda. It's wonderful to be here, and it's wonderful to have the Rome Historical Society sponsor this work. It's also wonderful to see some people that I know, Jan and Jim and Dot and other people, and also some new people. Um, these stories are not only really interesting and exciting, but also, I think, speak to us as we live in our own times. And so uh, this... Um, presentation is part of a survey of historic sites relating to the Underground Railroad abolitionism and African American life in all of Oneida County. And um, it's several people, many people worked on this. It came out of Fort Stanwix and the National Park Service with help from the Organization of American Historians. And it will be online in January, the whole report. And we had a wonderful local advisory board that met every month for two years. And uh, Art Simmons from the Rome Historical Society was on it. And uh, I think other people from Rome as well. We wanna thank Keith Routley who really got the idea for this project and wrote the grant for it. And Paul Zarecki from the Organization of American Historians, Diane Miller from the National Park Services Network to Freedom and all the people who really did so much research and writing for this huge project. Um, Jan Demichis, Ellie Collins, Jessica Harney, Mary Hayes Gordon, James Ponzo, Milt Cernet, Deirdre Sinnott. Thank you all so much. 
And this presentation is dedicated to people who escaped from slavery on the Underground Railroad. Without their decision to escape slavery, there wouldn't be an Underground Railroad and there wouldn't be this project. We also want to dedicate it to Ellie Collins from Rome, whose research on the Underground Railroad in Rome, New York, was so important in, in providing a basis for the work we're doing here. She shared everything she had found and we're so grateful to her. The results of this survey across the uh, Oneida County and in Rome in particular, um, suggest that the Underground Railroad operated very successfully in this area in the years before the Civil War and that it was sustained by a network of local people most of them were um, either people of color who were free people and had escaped or had escaped from slavery, European Americans or people of native descent. And before we look specifically at Rome, let's take a look at the larger issues of the Underground Railroad across the country. A lot of people ask, what was the Underground Railroad? And they'll, they'll answer it themselves and they'll say, well, I don't think my house was on the Underground Railroad because it doesn't have a tunnel in the basement. You don't need a tunnel. Um, in, in fact, there are just no well-documented tunnels anywhere. Instead, what we've used to, to, for, to guide our research is the, is the um, way that the National Park Service um, identifies the Underground Railroad. They talk about it as resistance to enslavement through escape and flight through the end of the Civil War. And what that does is open up a whole lot of sites that are more than just safe houses, which is what we've maybe thought of as the traditional way we look at the Underground Railroad. So we can look at places from which um, people escape from slavery. We can look at the routes they took. We can look at safe houses as well as hiding places. We can look at places they worked, went to church, lived, and many of them did settle in this area and, and live and send their kids to school and work in this Rome area. It's also the story, not just of freedom seekers, but of allies that they found and they were people of a whole variety of backgrounds. Some of them were famous. You probably recognize Frederick Douglass, who spoke in Rome and Spencer Hall in 1857. Um, some of them, like uh, Harriet Tubman, escaped from slavery and brought others through Rome and through uh, along on the, the New York Central Railroad. But most of them were very ordinary people whose names we don't generally recognize. They were all operating between the revolution and the Civil War in the context of what some historians have called deep change in America, changes in economics and the social structure and cultural values that really affected everyone and that often revolved around the issue of what it meant to be an American in a country founded by the Declaration of Independence that said all men are created equal. What did equality mean in a world that was en enduring such rapid change? The Underground Railroad is certainly a national story. Um, it, has, it, it certainly separated North from South, and it contributed to debates over slavery that many people think really led directly to the Civil War. But it's also a local story. And in the 1830s, um, Abolitionists locally recognized that. They said the nation's made up of localities and local effort everywhere existing is the whole work we wish and need to have accomplished. And today we look at this and we realize the Underground Railroad doesn't operate in the ether. It operates in very specific local places with local people and local sites. Local Black histories matter, as do local histories in general. As we look about at the Underground Railroad, a lot of people say, well, why should we care? What does it mean for us? This is my personal perspective as an historian. It connects us in a powerful way to the past, which means it connects us to ourselves. Because as James Baldwin and many other people have said, history isn't the past, it's not done, it's the present, it's what we are today, it's shaped us and so it becomes part of ourselves. So the way we understand the past helps us understand our relationship to ourselves and to the present. 
And it also offers a, a kind of ray of hope in a time when we desperately need hope. Just as slavery was part of America's creation story, and so too are the efforts to resist slavery. And as Fergus Bordewick, who wrote a very excellent national story of the Underground Railroad bound for Canaan, has characterized the Underground Railroad as America's first racially integrated civil rights movement, an epic story, an answer to slavery's legacy of hurt and shame. And upstate New York is full of these stories, um, an answer to slavery's legacy of hurt and shame. Declaration of Independence, it contains the phrase that all men are created equal. And then if you go to Seneca Falls, they decided all men and women are created equal. And this generation of abolitionists is the, they're the sons and daughters of the revolutionary generation. And so they embrace that ideal that all people are created equal. But they also inherited a commitment to community, to their responsibility. They called it civic virtue for creating a community in which the, the blessings of liberty adhered for all people. And so it was that tension between a focus on individual rights and an awareness of their responsibility to ensure that those rights adhered for everyone that gave tremendous energy to the abolitionist and underground railroad movements. So one of the things that I look at and and I invite you to look at when we look at this movement is what did those rights and responsibilities mean to this, that generation? And what do they mean for us today? A lot of people will say this was a secret movement, so we can't really learn anything about it. It's a good point, except it's not quite accurate. And many times and places there are echoes and clues it's a real detective story, which is one of the reasons it makes it so much fun to research. And you can find um, anecdotal and other kinds of evidence in many different sources. Here are a couple of newspapers written at the time by people who were involved. There are many memoirs. I think we found six for Oneida County of people who were involved, most of them escaping from slavery local history, census records, and then all of the property in information with maps and deeds and tax assessments and mortgages. And then the buildings themselves give us clues. For Rome, there were two especially important local sources. Um, Colonel Arden Seymour, who was himself involved in the Underground Railroad, wrote two articles in the Roman Citizen in 1872, right before he died, that are full of details and stories about the Underground Railroad. And then census records proved especially helpful. And you'll see some examples of both of those sources as we go further into this presentation. Roman Oneida County were real hot spots in the Underground Railroad, primarily because it was a hub of transportation uh, across New York State, east and west, and also north and south. And here's Oneida County right in the middle. So it became water, a hub of water transportation, of roads, of canals, and of railroads. And people who escaped from slavery took all of those transportation routes, just like everyone else did. And at the same time, not only was at this geographic crossroads, it was at a time, a crossroads in time from colonial America to the 19th century, from an agricultural to an industrial Northeast um, economy, from native people to Europeans who took over, in this case, Oneida lands. Um, and Rome in particular was a hot spot because here, this is an 1846 image, a woodcut, of Rome, New York, and you see the train, and you see the canal being pulled by a couple of horses, and you see um, the road graphically illustrated the way that those three uh, transportation routes really um, came together. One of the questions we often get is how many people actually traveled on the Underground Railroad, and the honest answer is we don't have, a, we don't really know, but 
nationally, up to 100,000 is generally accepted as um, an estimate. So broad, it's hardly useful. But And thousands of those people went to Canada. Thousands of others settled in northern states, 20, 25,000 maybe. In Rome, and any place we have a specific local community, we can use census records, which are clunky, but the best evidence we have, to help us figure out some approximate numbers. And uh, Jan Diamichis did a beautiful database of every African-American listed in the census records in Oneida County for 1850, 55, 60, and 65, and 70. And in Rome in those years, there are 104 African-Americans listed in census records. Little more than half of those were listed in only one year. Um, and a little less than half were there in at least two years. Uh, so they lived in Rome for at least five years. Um, that's an interesting statistic because you think if they, the, the little more than half that was there in one census year, that suggests there probably were people there in 1851, 1852, 1853, 1854, in between all the census years that were also transient. So this number is probably um, could be expanded exponentially for the a total number of people who actually settled or were listed and came through Rome in one year at, at transients. Um, census takers ask for place of birth and I just ask you to imagine if you had if you had escaped from slavery and were living in Rome, census taker is a federal official. 1850, the federal government passed the Fugitive Slave Act, which uh, imposed thousand dollar fines for anyone helping someone to escape from slavery, and you could be prosecuted and captured by federal marshals and taken back to slavery without being able to speak in your own behalf. I always wonder if I would have told the truth if a federal official came to my door and said, where are you born? And I just come from Maryland. And we found evidences that we know people said, oh, I was born in Westchester County. I was born in Pennsylvania. So this is probably a total undercount. Keep that in mind. But based on place of birth in a southern state, a foreign country, mostly Canada, or um, one person said, gosh, I forgot, or I don't know. At least 56 people who had escaped from slavery, we can generalize, uh, suggest that's a clue that they had escaped from slavery, settled in Rome between 1850 and 1870, and 12 of, that, of those settled for more than five years. When we look at length of residence, there's a really startling difference between those people who were uh, born in the South, a foreign country, or unknown possible freedom seekers, and those people who were possible free people of color listing a birthplace in New York State. If you were um, a freedom seeker, possibly as identified by that kind of surrogate definition with place of birth, you were probably a transient. You settled just very briefly. If you were a free person of color, uh, born in New York State, you tended to live in Rome for five years or more. Here's some interesting um, specifics. More than three quarters of the people who were listed in only one census record listed those birthplaces as a southern state. And here's some examples of where they came from. Quite a diverse group uh, coming from all over the South and the West Indies and Canada. Um, in contrast, three quarters of the people who lived in Rome for at least five years listed birthplaces in New York State, New York State, Herkimer County, Oneida County, suggesting they may have been enslaved in New York State because New York State had slavery till 1827. They may have been born free they, or, or they may have been born free. And there are, are several families that consistently are listed in the census records. You I don't know if any of them still may live in Rome now. Um, so overwhelmingly, we can say that transients, as identified by being only in one census, tended to be possible freedom seekers born in the South or a foreign country. And the stable population tended to be three quarters of them free people of color. 
There were 12 exceptions to that. Three individuals and one family were listed in Rome in more than two census records, but they were also born in the South. And they're of a special interest because not only did they probably escape from slavery, they probably were helping other people do the same. So here are their names. Arnold B. Williams was a Baptist clergyman from North Carolina. He owned a house. William Johnson was a barber, owned a house, born in Georgia. Stephen Thompson was a barber, and he said, gosh, in one census, I don't know where I was born. The other census, he said, Maryland. So that's kind of a red flag that he probably had escaped from slavery. And then this Bowen Stevenson family had nine members. Um, Henrietta Bowen was the matriarch and her, a couple of her daughters and her, one of her daughter's husbands and all of the children. And they'd been born in Maryland, Delaware, or Washington, D.C., and we'll see a site that may relate to where they lived. And they, they're a particularly interesting family and elusive. So if anyone wants to do more work, this is a good place to start. So what sites document these stories? Um, we found 69 sites across Oneida County, and there probably are many more. Um, and 17 of those were in Rome, and they were some of them military sites, escape routes, homes of freedom seekers, safe houses kept by people of European descent, uh, or abolitionist and church activities. Um, and here are the two military sites in Rome. One of them is Fort Bull. This is a uh, a map that was reprinted in 1851 in the documentary history of the state of New York. And you can see that New York state had a water route from Albany all the way to Lake Ontario at Oswego by water. You could take a boat except for this little space here between the Mohawk river and Wood Creek. That became a point that was extremely important for military operations in the 18th century. And, um, Wood Creek um, the, had a fort, Fort Bull, which it, you can still see its ramparts. And Art Stevens took Jen DiMicci's and I on a wonderful tour of this one day last year. Um, and you can also see the remains of the portage that went from the Mohawk River to Wood Creek and enters Wood Creek right at the bottom of that picture. Today, the marker that commemorates that spot, commemorates a terrible um, massacre, really, in March 18, 1755, in which the French totally destroyed the British fort and killed everyone with an, a major explosion. And you can see here, this is Wood Creek, you can look through the woods where the passageway would have been, um, a witness tree that still bears the scorch marks from what was probably the explosion in that day that totally destroyed that fort. And it's marked with a, a sign. It's breathtakingly wonderful. <laughs> um, but one of the things that doesn't show up on any signs and that we are, we find little clues is that not all the people there were either French or English descent that some of them were people of color. And we've only got a documentary clue about one of them, Monsieur de la Rie, who was the French commander, was informed that a Negro who had accompanied the loads on the sleighs, they were taking material from basically Fort Stanwix to um, Fort Bull, had escaped and had gone back to Fort Williams, which is where Fort Stanwix is now and reported to the British that the French were there. And so it's little clues like that that make you ask, that was one person of color, was he free? Was he enslaved? Was he a soldier? Was he a wagoneer? Um, was, how old was he? Uh, and we just don't know. And how many other people of color may well have been in that expedition. And the same situation comes for Fort Stanwix. In, 18, in 1783, George Washington told uh, Colonel Marnus Willett, um, who was the, the Tryon County militia guy at that time, to take one last expedition in the American Revolution. And his, his orders were to go to 
um, Fort Ontario at Oswego on a surprise attack and take on Ontario, Fort Ontario from the British. Um, unfortunately, they decided they had to go in February and they were timing it to the, the phases of the moon. If you know and you do well, the kind of weather we endure in February in upstate New York, you could probably predict what happened. They ran into a blizzard. They were discovered. They were late. They never got to attack the fort. They came home desperate for food, freezing their feet. One person died of overexposure. But along with that expedition went a man named Henry Bakeman, whose pension records we have, who was a person of color. We don't know whether born slave, enslaved or free from the Mohawk Valley. And the 1st Rhode Island Regiment, which was a multiracial regiment, also went on that expedition. Fort Stanwix had been abandoned by that time, so they probably did, well, we don't know, they may have camped by, in, or near the fort. Um, but you wonder how many other people of color were with that expedition and also in generally in this area and as soldiers, as valets, as wagon drivers, as cooks. Uh, again, the question remains, but you see little glimpses of some that we can document well. Um, there is, um, if we begin to look at the way it, the transportation, not just by water, but by roads, influenced uh, the Underground Railroad in Rome. One key site in particular, this is the Stanwix Hotel, it's now gone, but it was owned by um, Marquis de Lafayette Kenyon, sometimes just spelled Marcus. Mm. And he was called a noble-hearted man and he owned the stage line. He, wrote, he owned the Rome Oswego stage line. And he was perfectly willing to take anyone escaping from slavery from Fort Stanwix or from the Stanwix Hotel to what he called the Freedmen's Depot. And we know Tudor Grant was a barber in Oswego who had an underground railroad site right there on the river at Oswego. And it was also the site of a barber shop kept by William Johnson, probably the William Johnson from Georgia, who had escaped from slavery. So... Um, it's right downtown, and it's an important road transportation route that was regularly used. When the Erie Canal was completed in 1825, it too became a major underground railroad transportation center. One of the very, the very first evidence that I know about the Underground Railroad was from Thomas James's autobiography. He had been enslaved in Montgomery County near Canajoharie. And he talked about escaping from slavery, taking the, he said, the newly staked line of the Erie Canal and just following it westward. And he crossed into Canada at Youngstown and there he was free. He later came back and helped form the AME Zion Church in Rochester and became an important uh, abolitionist underground railroad person himself. Um, Rome itself, also became a major railroad center. The Utica-Syracuse Railroad, this, the railroad that went west to Syracuse was completed 1839. This is just a little, aren't they funny looking railroad trains? And then the Rome-Watertown-Ogdensburg Railroad that went north um, was 1842. In 1853, there were between seven and 10, you different sources say different things, short railroad lines consolidated into the New York Central Railroad. The New York Central Railroad operators and administrators seem to have been very sympathetic to the Underground Railroad. We have a story from Syracuse in which um, people who needed help to transport people escaping from slavery would just go, they'd knock on the dining room window of one of the, the um, uh, New York Central uh, vice presidents and say, um, we need tickets, and he'd just pass them out. So they were, uh, and so that's probably going on here as well. Um, famous people like Harriet Tubman took the New York Central through Rome. And like the canal, if you get on at Albany and you go west to Niagara Falls, you know you're coming through Utica, Rome, and every place in Oneida County. So uh, you get to count Harriet Tubman in Rome, and she's got uh, 
several incidents of taking people, including one with Joe Bailey. That's really a funny story. And after the suspension bridge was completed uh, for rail traffic in 1855, people would just get on the train like Tubman, bringing people from New York City through Albany and then through Utica, Rome, Syracuse, Rochester, right straight to Niagara Falls. And they just ride right across the river at the suspension bridge. Um, but there are also little clues that other people escaping from slavery were using the railroad. And the most detailed one we have comes from the Daily Sentinel in 1855 by an, on, the author did, was anonymous, did not sign his or her name. It was a young man named Jim Anderson who was, um, and this is the rail station, it's still on the same site today. Um, he had been escaping from uh, Annapolis, Maryland with a cousin and they were going to the St. Lawrence River and they got that far and, a, and he, they, he lost his cousin and he was about to be taken over the river to Canada the next morning. People got up and he wasn't there. He decided to come back south to try to find his cousin. He's riding in the baggage car and while he was there, this man gave him a lot of questions about his experience and where he'd come from and how he got there. And we don't know whether he ever found his cousin, if he ever got to Canada or what happened. But he did describe um, his route, which is unusual to have such detail. So I've marked it out here. I don't know how well you can see it. It's in blue. Um, and he says he started in Annapolis, he went to Baltimore, he went to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and it's really a straight shot right up to Elmira, where John Jones, who had escaped from slavery in Virginia in 1843 or four, kept the main um, safe house and put people on the railroad. From um, Elmira, he often put people on uh, the railroad to the suspension bridge. But in this case, he sent the Jim Anderson to Binghamton and then to Syracuse. And from there he went to Rome and from there he went to Cape Vincent, I think. And then he he's riding back to Rome when he tells his story. Um, local abolitionists, both black, white and native, uh, but in Christian churches often form the main support group locally for people escaping from slavery. Um, these churches were dominated, formed generally the earliest ones by European Americans, but I've learned to be very humble and, and not to say they're white churches, because if you can actually get um, membership records for these churches, you often find that they have black members as well as white ones. And uh, the man who's most associated with uh, religious revivals is Charles Grandison Finney, who started in Adams, New York, and had a huge revival in Westernville, and probably an earlier church building. This looks like a little bit later, but I'm not sure. And then he came to Rome, where he had an astounding revival, and then he went to Utica. And in this church, actually the first Presbyterian church, and this is the second Presbyterian church on Bleecker Street, converted hundreds of people. And this church became the site in October 21st, 1835, of the formation of the New York State Anti-Slavery Society, where about 400 whites and blacks formed a statewide anti-slavery society and barely escaped being, uh, they did escape, they, but they were disrupted by a mob who broke up the whole meeting of gentlemen of property and standing, said the reports. And at the invitation of Garrett Smith, who was at that meeting, they came to Peterborough, where they held their first annual meeting of the New York State Anti-Slavery Society in this church, which is still standing. And I see Dot Wilsey there. Thank you, Dot, for helping preserve this. There were at least seven people from Rome who attended that meeting. And Arden Seymour recounts their experience in the 1872, one of his articles. They um, went to Whitesboro safely, 
Then they went to Vernon and they confronted a mob in Vernon. And we have not been able to document this well. So that's another, if someone wants a good story to try to find more details, this would be wonderful. A lawyer of the village led a mob with mud, mud brick bats, stones, and clubs. And uh, Arbor Blair, Do Dr. Blair was struck on his head, lost his hat, hat bruised his face. Um, they made it out of town and drove through Stockbridge Hollow, which is so-called because it was the site of Stockbridge and Brotherton Indian uh, settlements. And they got help from the Stockbridge Indians and Arden Seymour says they're more civilized than some of their neighbors, he thought. So they made it to Peterborough going through there. Um, the Stockbridge Indians, one account says there were 200 graves of African-Americans in their graveyards. I uh, don't know if we'll ever find out if that's true or not, but they did become a haven for people of color. Um, several of those who went to Peterborough that day had joined the Second Presbyterian Church in Rome, which apparently it broke off from the first church, and I suspect over abolitionist ideas. The site of that church is empty today. And here it is in an 1886 uh, map that you can see it right here. Um, members of both the first and second Presbyterian church, probably many other people signed a lot of anti-slavery petitions. Abolitionists adopted that because in part it was very effective it was a way to educate local people. You had to go door to door and get signatures and explain why. And it was cheap at a time, especially after the depression of 1837, they did not have a lot of money. And uh, this one gives you an idea of their sentiments, a heinous sin against God, a flagrant violation of the rights of man with Christianity, with our national declaration of independence and our Republican values, subversive, subversive of the liberties of the laboring part of our Republic, a national crime. They were very clear. And women from Rome and elsewhere also signed anti-slavery petitions. Um, this one was sometimes called the Fathers and Rulers Petition. And I found it interesting because they quote Thomas Jefferson, we tremble for our country when we remember that God is just. Um, and then they quoted, we remember them who are in bonds as bound with them, which was a common quote uh, from the Bible that abolitionists often used as a way to explain their commitment to abolitionism. Um, there seemed to have developed by the 1830s this very strong well-identified network of local European Americans. And again, this comes from Arden Seymour, one of his letters. He describes a story about a colored man trembling with fear, a cold day, and he came to the store owned by Arden Seymour and took a seat by the stove. Seymour fed him, talked about being three days in the swamp, nothing to eat. He was being pursued closely by his enslaver. So Arden Seymour took him to Dr. Blair's, that's Arbor and Wealthy Blair's house, who had a room where he kept him in safety. And, and then on Monday morning, he went to Marcus Kenyon, who took him on the stagecoach to Oswego. <coughs> and here, this is Arden and Sally Seymour's store and home. And this is what it looks like today. It's no longer standing. There's another store there. Um, and he's, they're full. The uh, newspapers are full of ads from the Seymours and about their store. Um, and Seymour took the man to the home of, Arden, of Arba and Wealthy Blair. And uh, this is the house that they lived in at that time. And it was, it's right behind the Episcopal church. And again, it's not standing now. Um, so that's another loss, but, um, <clears throat> and the other person that Arden Seymour had mentioned was Marcus Kenyon. I want to say again, a bit about him here. This is his Fort Stan, his, I'm sorry, Stanwick's hotel uh, stagecoach operation. <clears throat> where William Johnson from Georgia, the barber from Georgia, also worked. 
Um, Kenyon moves from here. He makes an alliance with John Butterfield, who owns a big hotel and stage thing in Utica. And they go to Washington, D.C., and they get the contract for the Pony Express that goes from St. Louis, Missouri to San Francisco, California in 1852. And then in 1857, Kenyon gets the contract to carry passengers who are going to California by sea through the Isthmus of Panama, so they, the boats can't get through there. There's no Panama Canal. So Kenyon takes people on a plank road, the 12 miles from the east, east coast of Panama to the west coast, so they can. And so something's going on with his business operations, and he says, we got it from the southern slave owners, firebrand people who are uh, and so he's very proud of the fact that he got those contracts and very aware that it went to a person from a free state instead of a slave state. I think he becomes part of a network we'll just briefly allude to. I can't figure it out, though. So if anyone has good ideas and wants to pursue this, it's a great story. Well, that local group of European Americans organized in response to people escaping from slavery. And we know there were many who came through Rome because a lot of them settled there. And again, um, this is the another quote from Arden Seymour about uh, the Brown family. He was a joiner, which is part of a carpenter. He worked for Bradford Dean, who was a master builder. He built his house and it was on Dominic Street. Here it is, the first house west of the bridge on the south side of the street. Here it is in the 1886 uh, bird's eye view of Troy, New York. This is what the site looks like today. Um, and they fled to Canada after the Fugitive Slave Act. His wife said, we can't stay here anymore. We might be captured. Um, African-Americans who settled in Rome organized an African Methodist Episcopal Church <clears throat> And we're not sure again where it was. Some pe local people think it might be this building right here, but we have not been able to find a deed for it. So again, if people would like to follow this up, it'd be wonderful to find the site of this church. It held a state convention <coughs> in 1853. Jermaine Logan from Syracuse, who was called the king of the Underground Railroad, uh, for the work that he and his wife, Caroline Storm Logan, who had relatives in Oneida County, did on the Underground Railroad in Syracuse. He came and spoke at that convention. One of the ministers was Levin Tillman, who was born enslaved in Caroline County, Maryland. He wrote a memoir, I wish to express indelibly my opposition and hatred to slavery. And the picture comes from a local historian in Jordan, New York, where James Beulah, Levin Tillman's brother, settled, and he is carrying a basket because he bought two pieces of property by the railroad and made his living. There weren't any McDonald's, so he, he and his family would make sandwiches and sell them to traffic rail passengers. Uh, there may also have been a second church, a Baptist church. The clue is Arnold B. Williams, born in North Carolina, is listed as a Baptist clergyman, owner of land and a voter. Well, if you have a Baptist clergyman, I mean, he's either serving a Baptist church with a dominant white congregation, which may have been true, or there's a black Baptist church, and we just don't really know at this point. So again, another clue to follow up. And then this is the the Bowen Stevenson family, and their home may be still standing. It may be this one on Bulk Street. The only, we have two clues about the location. One clue says it's Bulk Street by the canal, and that's really by the canal. And the other one from Ellie Collins, she seems to have found a small piece of land, like maybe a quarter of an acre, bought by Marcus Kenyon in this Bulk Street area. So one possibility is that Kenyon bought that land or this house, and then the Stevenson family settled there, and we've not been able to find that Kenyon deed um, either. So that's another thing that needs to be followed up. The reason this family is so interesting is many reasons, but 
Um, they all listed their birthplaces, Delaware, Maryland, or Washington, D.C., except for the youngest child, Samuel, who, or maybe the two youngest who were born in Rome in New York State. Um, in 1858, William Bradley, who had been mayor of District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., in the 1830s, became the first postmaster in Washington, D.C., uh, signed manumission papers freeing Sally Bowen, uh, Stevenson and all of her children, including the ones born in New York State. That's 1858, and they've been living in New York State in Rome since 1850. And um, Sally Bowen's mother, Henrietta Bowen, came with this family and with one of her other daughters. And Sally Bowen had married Alfred Stevenson, who was a brick molder. And Listed in one sense, it says a brick molder. Sally Bowen's brother, Anthony Bowen, rem remained in Washington, D.C., helped form a church, and became the first Black employee of the post office, I think maybe because of his connection with William Bradley. And um, he is known, or I, there's, I've not found the primary source evidence, but it's one of those everybody says he was a major underground railroad operator in Washington, D.C. Marcus Kenyon is obviously doing something in Washington, D.C. because he's getting these big contracts. William Chaplin, who had been an agent of the New York State Anti-Slavery Society, the first corresponding secretary in the 1830s, went to Washington, D.C. in the mid-1840s deliberately to set up um, a kind of station that would channel people from slavery north. And he wasn't terribly successful in many cases. He had a brilliant idea of hiring a ship called the Pearl. 77 African-Americans in April 1848 got on that ship to a sail to freedom. The ship was becalmed. Every one of them was recaptured and sold into slavery. So he's working at it, but he's not necessarily having a lot of success. The possible hypoth the hypothesis is that um, he was working with the Bowen family, probably with the assistance of William Bradley, and that the Bowen Stevenson family settled in Rome by the canal in 1850. We know they're in eight, they're there in 1850. At the time, the Fugitive Slave Act was being passed as a safe house where Chaplin and maybe Kenyon and probably Anthony Bowen could be sure that people they were sending north would find safe haven in Rome, New York. There's This is a total hypothesis at the moment. If anybody has great ideas about how to document it, it would be absolutely wonderful. The Bowen Stevenson family moved back to Washington, D.C. Um, sometime after 1862. Anthony or um, Alfred Stevenson worked for the First Presbyterian Church in 1862 for a while, so we know they're there then, but then they moved back to Washington, D.C. But it's that elusive connection uh, and a, a sense there's probably some clearly organized network connecting Washington, D.C. with Rome and other places in upstate New York that would be wonderful to document. And finally, one of the most interesting people um, is Bob Wilson. He may be, he's the only person I know in print who worked both for the Confederate armies and the Union armies in the Civil War. He was enslaved in a plantation in Culpeper, Virginia, his master took him, his enslaver, took him to the Confederate Army where he worked, uh, I think, as a wagon driver, maybe carrying goods, maybe as an ambulance driver. He escaped. He was recaptured, jailed. Um, his enslaver captured, got him out of jail, took him back to the plantation in Culpeper. And wouldn't you know, but the 117th New York Infantry, made up mostly of Oneida County men, captured that plantation. And Bob Wilson donned a Union Army uniform and marched back to the main house with a gun and captured his former enslaver. 
And from then on, he went with that unit to Petersburg, where the commander was killed. And then he worked with the second commander. And after the war, he came to Rome. He married um, a local woman born in New York State. Um, and they bought actually two houses. And Art Simmons found both of them. They're both right there. And I think um, you can kind of see the, I don't see the, the name, but, but it, oh, Van Dusen, right there. Um, here, th those two houses, and they're still standing. He lived in Rome, worked as a horse trainer, um, had a, a band, became a very popular and well-known figure in Rome, and did not die until 1937. At They think he's over 100 years old. Well, in 1872, shortly after he published the articles on the Underground Railroad, Arden Seymour died, and another of the old landmarks of Rome has been removed by death. One by one, the links that connect the present with the former generation pass away. Could say the same thing for the buildings. Arden Seymour was buried in Rome Cemetery. Oh, sorry. Um, Along with a lot of underground, other underground railroad activists, black and white in Rome, Henrietta Bowen, who was the matriarch of the Bowen Stevenson family, is also buried there. And so is Bob Wilson in an unmarked grave. And there's a local effort to get raise money to build a, a marker for him. Um, this project is a great beginning, but it's not an end to the story of the Underground Railroad and to researching it. So here are some specific ideas if any of you would like to move forward with further research. Um, deeds might help us tell more about homes that A.B. Williams and others owned who were freedom seekers who lived in Rome and owned property. Grave sites in the Rome Cemetery can be identified just through cemetery records. The Pomeroy Foundation would be a good place to um, ask for markers to help identify and mark some of these sites. The Network to Freedom, uh, Jan Diamichis is working on um, a nomination for a site in Stuben related to the Welsh abolitionists there. And there are lots here in Rome that could be also done. And then the National um, Register of Historic Places is also another way to identify and offer some potential for funding for some of these sites. Um, I do think echoes of the Underground Railroad are still here and they haunt us if we listened for them. But they also remind us that just as oppression exists, so do people who worked for equal rights, for respect, for responsibility for each other, for liberty and freedom for all of us. So I thank you so much for being here to think about this with me and to carry on the vision. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judy. That was wonderful. Um, I have a question and I would like to remind everyone watching, if you have any questions, you can definitely put them in the chat and we will address them. Um, but my question to you, Judy, is a lot of what you talked about was in the early 1800s. How far back do you suspect the Underground Railroad was operating, whether officially or unofficially? Uh, mm -hmm. If you go into uh, places like, uh, well, I think it operated wherever slavery operated. Uh, some of the best known 17th century examples are in Florida. Fort Mose in Florida is to near St. Augustine. It's completely made up of people who escaped from slavery in Georgia and South Carolina. Um, we don't have good evidence for New York State in the 17th century um, or even the 18th century, but we do so that we mostly focused here on the early 19th century. And there, there were not European Americans in, uh, I think before the revolution, the farthest west that Europeans settled was Deerfield, which is just on the eastern edge of Oneida County. And um, the Coventry family in Deerfield did own people in slavery. There were people 
we've got some clues about people who escaped from slavery in Oneida County, one in uh, Clinton, uh, New York, and uh, just little clues that I aren't, aren't solid enough to say anything, but um, one of the, the largest enslaver in Oneida County was also a signer of the Declaration of, Sentiment, uh, Declaration of Independence. So it's a kind of, um, in, in Western, it, and it's an irony that that should be so. Yeah. Um, Peggy has a question. Are there any markers placed at the historical sites that you had mentioned in this presentation? No except for Fort Bull and the one about the wipeout in 1755, the total destruction. Right. So um, I can assume that that would be something that in the future would be a, a great feat to accomplish getting those places uh, physically mm -hmm. marked. Uh, Jan Diamichis and Mary Hayes Gordon and Deirdre Sinnott with the uh, Oneida County Freedom Trail Commission um, ha have erected markers in Utica um, really nice interpretive signs, so they'd be good people to talk with. Um, the Pomeroy markers are generally modeled on the ones that New York State used to uh, put up, like blue with gold lettering, and they're metal. Um, and the Pomeroy Foundation, they're free to you. They're very strict about primary source documentation as well they should be because these markers are going to last for hundreds of years if we're lucky but um they they'll if, if they accept the nomination they'll ship them to you and all you have to do is dig a hole put some cement in and stick the stick the pole <laughs> to put it up so it's a wonderful program yes um so judy i'm curious you you've mentioned so many stories that would be a great a great place for someone else to to pick up and do research if they were interested or had ideas um, how could someone get in touch with you and learn more about how they can do that and how their efforts can uh, contribute to to your research and, and this greater story um, you can use my email and i don't think i put it on here it's just historical new york all written out one word at me.com but you can also talk to Jan Diamichis or Mary Hayes Gordon or Deirdre Sinnott. Um, the, uh, the Oneida County Freedom Trail Commission has a lovely website, so you can get on there and connect with them as well. Okay, thank you. Um, someone asked if there will be a recording of this, and the answer is yes. Um, immediately, it will be available on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Historical. Um, in a few days, we will upload it to our YouTube channel. And on both of those, we can make Judy's information available and also link to the United County Freedom Commission and um, yeah. some other places that we may find uh, to help people who are interested to find out more. Yes, it's, it's a, it is a real detective story. So it's really exciting when you run across something that's a, a gem and you may well find things. So share them, pass them along. And uh, I want to say too that Rome Historical Society, we have a, a lot of resources here um, and we do have uh, the ability to make our resources available to the public. So if anyone does is interested in doing research, um, that will be one opportunity that you can, you can do some digging here in our stuff and maybe find something that we've never seen or thought to look at before. Um, Jan Diamichis is on this call. Do you want to say anything, Jan, about how people can follow up? Uh, people can certainly follow up by contacting me. Uh, people often ask me, well, um, how do I start this process of looking into history and finding out about the Underground Railroad and maybe my house is on the underground? How do I go about doing that? And I say, well, First thing, go find out what other people found out first. Go look at your local town histories, you know, your Oneida County histories, uh, and then they will start to put you on to other sources. You want to take a look at uh, some of the resources that are now available that weren't before. For instance, if you suspect that your house was once an underground railroad station, well, who owned it before the Civil War? Mm -hmm. And can that person's name be found on a, an anti-slavery petition which are now being more and more uh, available to, for public use. Uh, they've been uh, 
Uh, Judy knows all about this. They've been, uh, uh, for a night accounting, uh, they've been digitized and available through uh, Utica College's his historical uh, digital, digital history project. Um, and one thing leads to another is what I always like to say. <laughs> if you can find someone else to talk to, someone else who's interested, uh, they always know something to put you on and you can play off of other people. Uh, find a group to join uh, who are interested in, in, in pursuing the same thing. Uh, you have to kind of invent your own historical research method. I did. I never did this before. And once you start to figure out how to tease out some of these clues, oh, I think I'll go to the census. Like, yeah, look at there. They're in this, they're in this census. They identify him as black. And yeah, look at that. And that <clears throat> start to look at census materials like that as well. And those are all available uh, it, it's, it's a laborious process, but it's re, it, the, the reward is rich. You can use that information for so many things. Um, yeah. You have to kind of invent it, but first of all, uh, what are you looking for? And start nosing around who also has been looking for this sort of stuff and let, let them start to do some of the heavy lifting for you by telling you, this is what I found, this is what you got to find too. Deeds will really help with the people whose names we have, black people who own property. Mm -hmm. And, and um, newspapers online, especially like newspapers.com, yes. Genealogy Bank, and all the genealogical research. It's really family history research that genealogists are so good at. And it's ancestry.com is a wonderful source. So, Well, thank you so much. I want to um, say to Mary Ellen Smith wrote in the in the chat um, that she has done some research on the Bowen Stevenson's program uh, family and has done a program on it. Um, oh. so Mary Ellen, if you are listening and still here, um, I would encourage you to keep an eye out for when I put Judith's information oh, up. Please do. Yes. Touch with her. Um, yeah. So this is great putting, you know, putting on a program like this and connecting uh all these people who are interested in this topic. Um, mm -hmm. Just checking to make sure that we didn't miss anyone's comments or questions. Um, but thank you again, everyone for being here and for joining us and Judy and Jan too, for, for being here and sharing all of your knowledge with us. Um, thank you, really, Miranda. Really and thanks to Art too, thank you. All right, everybody, if that's the end, we, um, we're going to end it. And of course, keep an eye out on our Facebook and our YouTube. We're going to put up a recording of this program and more information if you are interested in, in digging deeper. So, all right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thank Bye. you. Bye now. <laughs>